Um, I'm Injin Wu, and uh, today I'll be talking about S3 as the state say, a store for the stream processing systems. Um, a little bit about my background. I'm currently the founder of Rising Wave Labs, a basic a company building stream processing system. And before starting this company, uh, I was at the uh, Ethos Redshift as well as the IBM Research Armadon. I obtained my PhD in uh, stream processing and delivery systems. So over the last uh, probably 10 plus years, I've been focused on I mean, how to try to build a better stream processing and database systems for people to use in, uh, in production. And uh, what is Rising Wave? Just one slide. So Rising Wave is a distributed SQL streaming database. And um, I think there is um, uh, it's an open source database, and uh, it's uh, under Apache, released under Apache point, uh, 2.0 license. And I believe that's where it's probably one of the fastest growing projects in the, in the stream processing world. And Rising Wave has already been adopted in hundreds or even thousands of the companies well, across different industries, like fintech, financial services, like uh, banking, securities. Did you like? Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Hold a sec. Yeah. And banking, financial services, gaming, manufacturing, energy, and all these kind of industries. So let's, before talking about well, anything about the stream processing, let's talk about well, batch processing. As I just mentioned, I actually come from the, I mean, Redshift, right? Well, I used to work in Redshift, and I really love the Redshift system, right? Well, if you have never used the Redshift, probably you can think of like uh, BigQuery in Google, right? Or the or Snowflake, or probably these days, well, probably someone, so, uh, someone using Databricks, right? Rising Wave, uh, sorry, Redshift is uh, essentially a batch-based system, right? So it's a data warehouse. So the user behavior is like uh, people typically store the data in S3 and then or some other systems, right? The file systems or some other places. And then they batch load the data into Redshift. And then people can directly run queries against Redshift so as to generate the reports. That's how the batch based systems, especially data warehouses, uh, work, right? So Using, Rash, uh, using Redshift or using BigQuery, these kind of data warehouses, what if we want to, let's say, continuously generate our reports, right? Generate, refresh our reports, right? If you want to refresh a report, let's say, dash, or your dashboard every, let's say, six hours, then we can definitely use some um, existing tools like orchestration tools like Airflow, right? Or Dagster, right? Or some other orchestration tools to to basically continuously refresh the, the uh, uh, continuously run the queries against the Redshift so as to generate a better, uh, to generate a fresh results, right? But what if we want to use Redshift to deal with streaming data? Essentially, in Redshift, there is a, uh, a large portion of the data actually coming from KNSS or come from Kafka or even come from Postgres CDC. I mean, this data is essentially streaming data, right? And if we want to process this kind of streaming data, then probably we don't really want to just refresh our dashboard every six hours, right? We probably really want to refresh our dashboard every, let's say, one minute or even 30 seconds, right? Or even 10 seconds, right? To make sure that well, the data or the result is as fresh as possible, right? But if we continue using this architecture, if we continue using Redshift plus, uh, let's say, orchestration too, then the problem becomes that well, it's super hard to generate a result. You will find that well, the, the, the system just uh, got stuck. Right? Why this can happen? Well, this is because well, Redshift uh, is a data warehouse. And for data warehouse, it always have to scan the entire table, let's say, terabytes of, uh, terabytes of data or even, uh, or even uh, petabytes of data to generate reports, it will be super slow. So we cannot use uh, batch-based systems. We cannot use, uh, use data warehouse to do this. Then how do we do that? Essentially, that's why we need to have stream processing. Stream processing systems are event uh, uh, essentially event-based, event-driven systems that can continuously process streaming data. right? 
as long as some, some new data comes in, we will just ingest the data, do some computation, and refresh the results, and probably send the results into some downstreaming systems. That's how a streaming system can work, right? Well, that's how the streaming, uh, stream, a stream processing system works. Right? Stream processing systems have already been evolved for over 20 years. The first of, uh, debate of a stream processing system was around uh, 2002, and at that time, it was still about, well, I mean, some research projects from MIT, from Stanford, from, um, from, from Brown University, and uh, there were still research prototypes. But soon people find that, okay, look, well, this kind of system is pretty useful, especially for doing monitoring, alerting, dashboarding, real-time dashboarding, right? So people started to think about, okay, how we can put these systems into production. And that's why we saw that, okay, over the last 10 years, essentially, or even 15 years, a lot of stream processing systems came out, like Apache Storm, Apache Samza, S4, and uh, Pipeline DB, Flink, well, and in Spark Streaming, Kisiko DB, and Rising Wave. Many, uh, many, many systems are coming out this year, right? And these systems have already been adopted in production in numerous, well, I mean, stream uh, uh, real time use cases, in real time applications like uh, S-Room implementations, dashboarding, travel booking, and many others, right? So, Stream processing have already been evolved for over 20 plus years, and a stream processing per system, a stream processing, existing stream processing system is perfect. Well, I have to say that well, there are still a lot of problems. Well, the first thing is that, well, a lot of people complain that well, stream processing systems are so difficult to learn and to develop, right? Whenever people think about, okay, stream processing, and people were thinking about, probably I have to code in Java, I probably have to code in Scala, right? And that's true that, well, okay, Storm and uh, Spark Streaming and probably some other systems uh, did provide Java and the Scala API. But to, address, uh, but to address this problem, we actually introduced a lot of, um, I mean, um, higher level APIs, right? That's why we saw that okay, modern databases, are, uh, modern stream processing systems are actually introducing, uh, basically introduced a SQL as the interface, so, that, so as to provide the, uh, to, so as to provide the users with the a database-like experience. Right? Rising Wave is also among one of these kind of systems. Rising Wave provides SQL, and but also it will also provides a UDF. You can use code in Java. You can code in, uh, code in Python in UDF. But different from the other systems, well, it essentially speaks Postgres uh, uh, protocol, which means that as long as you, you, have a, um, you, you know how to use Postgres, you can just use it, well, uh, you use Rising Wave. So if you, if you want to use Postgres, then the streaming pro if you, to do stream processing, the only thing you need to do is to create the materials you use. Right? So with this concept of materialized views, it also simplifies for well, how we can build the application. Without the database-like experience, then people, what, what the people need to do is that well, they actually need to mingle these systems together, right? Well, a stream processing system, a Kafka, and probably a database to put, mix them together so as to, uh, so as to build a, a pretty complicated pipeline. But with the database-like experience, what we can do is that okay, we can just build materialized views on top of materialized views and do database uh, data persistence and do data serving in one single system. But the issue I talk about was just about well, the user experience side. Right? And people will say that, okay, look, I mean, apart from user experience, there are still a lot of issues, right? What are these issues? Well, when, why people think that well, stream processing is so difficult? It's not because, well, I mean, the user experience. It's not just because of user ex uh, experience, but because of well, some other things. The first one come to our mind is that well, stream processing systems are practically very, uh, very difficult to support complex queries, such as streaming joins, right? If you just want to join two data, two data streams, and for sure, I mean, it's kind of easy, right? Well, I mean, two fact tables, well, probably it's kind of easy. But let's say that, well, what if you want to join, let's say, 10 different streams, right? And uh, what's, uh, what if uh, you want to probably join your data from, let's say, SAP or from, um, from Kafka and probably some other streams from Postgres and some others from MongoDB, right? Well, you want to join all this data. It, th this, kind, uh, this kind of uh, uh, application can make the stream processing system very vulnerable, and probably not all of them can support uh, uh, the, this kind of complex queries pretty well. 
And another issue with the existing student present system is that well, potentially it, they do not really support, or they do not have a, a good, very good support for high availability. So last month, I was traveling in Singapore, and I talked to, uh, I talked to a pretty big company, and they use the existing stream present system. And they told me that well, their system just crashed, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, in, in one midnight, and the system crashed for two hours. Why that can happen? Because well, stream processing systems, I will just mention later, have a pretty big concept that well, is called state management. And if the state, uh, if the system crashed, we actually need to think about like, how we can recover state, right? At that night, where well, the big company actually could not recover state from their uh, from your check, uh, from their checkpoint, so that's where well, they cannot serve any of their customers within two hours. Imagine that well, this is a pretty big company that serves probably millions of users in Asia. And another, uh, another issue in stream processing system is that well, people claim that okay, uh, it's super hard to do a dynamic scaling, right? For stream processing, it's totally different from batch processing in that well, the workload can fluctuate, right? For batch processing, what you can do is that you can just issue one query. And if the query is slow, then no worries, well, I can probably create more nodes and then probably run it again, right? But for stream processing, the thing here is that well, stream processing always say, uh, uh, means that continuous query processing, and, to, and because the workload can fluctuate, right? think about the Uber, right? the workload can fluctuate. It's super important for us to provision reasonable amount of resource to deal with the streaming workload. Right? But stream processing systems, I will mention later, later is, uh, they have challenges in handling dynamic scaling. And the last thing I would like to mention that people always uh, blame up, uh, claim, uh, bl uh, yeah, uh, criticize stream processing system is about the schema evolution. And all these kind of things were essentially leads to uh, uh, was caused by a, a single problem, that is state management. State management is, as I just mentioned, a very important concept in stream processing systems. Just imagine that we want to add monetization and we want to join two different streams. One is impression stream and the other one is click stream. To join these two streams, we want to essentially, um, essentially we actually need to maintain two different states. One is the state for the hash table, or hash table for the impression stream and the other one is the hash table for the click stream. Right? Every time a new table comes in into the impression stream, then we need to check, okay, whether there's a match in the, click, uh, in the hash table for the click stream. If there's a match, we, then we just emit the result, right? That's how stream processing works. The problem here is that, okay, how we handle this, uh, how we deal with the uh, state, right? We, the state must be, must be reliable, must be stored reliable, but the state also must be stored, or, uh, be accessed fast, right? Well, it cannot be super slow, but well, it also be, must be persisted, right? So managing the states well, is a big issue. Then how existing systems manage the states? Let's just uh, think about, uh, uh, let's just uh, think about uh, all, most of the existing systems adopt a, 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 a mechanism called well, MapReduce style. Uh, uh, they actually adopt a MapReduce style mechanism to manage the states. That is, well, they actually uh, couple the compute and storage architecture, uh, couple the compute and storage. What it means is that, well, and this kind of mechanism was basically adopted by all these mainstream uh, existing stream, uh, stream processing systems like Flink, Spark Streaming, Storm, SAMHSA, and many others. So in, this, in these systems, well, what if we want to scale from one system to three systems, right? What, what if we want, want to uh, process application in three different machines? Then what we we'll do is that we will essentially shuffle the state into three different shards and, and uh, basically place every single shot into one single machine. So that for in that we inside of that one single machine, the only thing the the, uh, the only thing the machine needs to do is to access its local state. This mechanism is highly uh, yeah, it's definitely highly performant, right? Well, because we, uh, for every single machine, they only need to access its local machine uh, local machines data. But the problem here is that well, obviously there are a lot of problems. Let's just uh, uh, look at these problems one by one. The first problem is supporting complex queries. We, as we just mentioned, let's say that we found, uh, if we shuffle the states into three pieces, right? Then what if the states just increased? 
if we increase the state, well, then problem here is that for every single node, we actually need to care about whether state size could exceed the, uh, exceed the storage size. If it seeks the storage size in any single machine, right, the system will crash. And in a distributed system, as long as you have experience managing distributed system, you will, you will know that well, this is highly likely to happen. Why? Because data is always, has also, uh, always has a screwiness, right? It also always screwed, right? So it's highly likely to happen, right? So in, in, this kind of, uh, in these cases, well, essentially, when we want to support well, complex queries like streaming joins, where they, st where they need to manage the large state, then we're highly likely to come from the world system crashes. Then let's talk about well, the second issue, the high VBT. Let's say that's well, okay, we still, uh, we still have three different machines, right? And uh, using the, using the so-called uh, so Hadoop-based architecture or so-called uh, coupled compute and storage architecture, what people do is that well, they actually have maintained the state in local machine while they have the, uh, uh, well, dump the checkpoint paradoxically into persistent storage, right? That's what, how people do, right? And let's think about, okay, what if one single machine just crashed? If just one, oh, if one single machine just crashed, then the solution we could have is that okay, we just okay put another machine, and ask this that machine to reload actually all these machines to reload the checkpoint because we need to go back to the previous states, right? To ask all these three, uh, all these machines to go back to the uh, uh, reload the checkpoint from the person storage, which could be S3 or could be some uh, object store, right? And after reloading, after recovering from the state, we can just replay the log so, so that we can, we can catch up with the, with the latest state, right? But, well, this mechanism looks pretty simple, but the problem here is that, well, as long as well, your state is big enough, let's say uh, several gigabytes or even probably several gigabytes, it's probably small enough, well, pro but probably several hundred, uh, several hundred of gigabytes, right? Then reloading the state from the repository storage could be very, very slow, and it could take hours to recover the system. And think about if I'm running a trading firm, right? Well, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the live, live market analytics, right? What will happen if, I, if, I, if the system just crashed for, uh, for two hours? I, will, I probably will go bankrupt, right? That's kind of pretty easy, right? So nobody would like, uh, would like to have this to happen. So in many companies, what they do, that's where they essentially have host and buy, so that, okay, I basically run two, two different machines, right? Two, two different sets of the applications at the same time, so that's where if one, system, one set of the system just crashed, well, then probably I can pivot to another system. But if you have host and buy, then you can imagine that, well, how expensive the system could be, right? That's a problem of a high ability. And the third thing is the dynamic scaling. For dynamic scaling, the thing here is that, well, I mean, uh, so let's say that if we want to migrate, uh, uh, scale the system from one system to, uh, let's say, from one node to three different nodes, what do we need to do? Well, we need to, what do we need to do is call this, uh, mechanical call a mechanical a state migration. So oh, definitely you can also reload from checkpoint. But in either way, essentially what you need to do is that you actually to populate the state into these new machines, into, the, the, into these three new machines. And, uh, before the, uh, and uh, after populating the state, you can, you can continue, uh, continuously run the, st uh, run the application. But again, if the state is large enough, then it also takes hours or uh, at least minutes or hours to recover from the state, uh, to recover, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, yeah, to, to, to resume the computation, right? So that's a problem of the, uh, uh, of the existing architecture, Hadoop-like architecture. So how do we, do, uh, how do we address the, all these problems? I didn't really mention the schema evolution, but I will talk uh, at the end of the talk. Then how do we, how do we, uh, how do we deal with well, the, 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 uh, all these problems? So essentially, we can think about, well, we can adopt a new technology called well, S3 as a primary storage architecture, right? So if you are not familiar with this kind of like buzzword, then probably you are more familiar with well, these terms like decoupled computer and storage architecture or shared storage architecture or even tier storage, right? 
And if you are not familiar with any of these keywords, then you can just imagine that, well, okay, it's more like a snowflake-like architecture. Right? So with this, uh, with this architecture, what we, uh, what we could do is that we essentially manage that we essentially use the uh, S3 or uh, uh, EC2 to uh, serve as the compute node, and we store all this data in S3. And uh, and thanks for the cloud native architecture, we essentially can achieve the so called the, uh, the infinite scaling of the infinite and the independent scaling of both compute and storage, right? What will happen if, let's say, the state, uh, state grows larger? You don't need to worry about that because well, the only thing, uh, because well, the, for S3, the volume is basically unlimited, right? We will never run out of storage in, the, in this case. So you can just rely on S3. And then what if we feel that okay, the, the computer is super slow? Well, the only thing we need to do is that okay, we probably can just add more, add more, uh, add more as EC2 insta instances, right? That is, uh, that's essentially how Snowflake works. And that's essentially how Writing Wave and the probably some other uh, systems that adopt a Snowflake-like architecture work. So let's, now let's go back to the previous questions. How we can use this architecture, how this new architecture can help the people, uh, to help people to better support complex queries? Well, as we just mentioned, if we just use Hadoop-like architecture, then the problem here is that for every single node, we actually need to uh, uh, guarantee that for the state size never exceed the, uh, the storage size, right? But if we adopt a, a Snowflake architecture, then the thing becomes that key. we never need to worry about for the state size. Because well, as I just mentioned, OK, the, I mean, the S3 uh, storage is unlimited. So as the storage uh, stays grows, well, we, need to we never need to worry about that. And, but how about high availability, right? High availability is still, I mean, can be in this case, well, if we adopting the same architecture, uh, we adopt the snowflake-like architecture, then high availability problem can be e also be easily solved. How do we do that? Well, the good thing here is that, okay, as I just mentioned, all the states are maintaining S3. Let's just imagine that if one single machine just crashed, right? What do we need to do? The only thing we need to do is to just boot another machine, and then it's done. It's recovered. Why? Because where the state is in S3. And as for that machine, it doesn't really need to reload the state. It doesn't really need to uh, so-called populate the state. And because well, it can directly access the current state from S3. So that's a magic. And because of this, we can essentially achieve the faster failure recovery right? in seconds, not in minutes, not in hours. It's in seconds. And now let's talk about the dynamic scaling. Similarly, let's think about okay, how we want to scale from one single node to three different nodes. Right? The magical thing here is that well, it's the same. Right? Well, because the well, state is measured in S3, so essentially what we can do is that we can just boost three different machines. And that's done. The elastic scaling is done. For that state, for, for these three new machines, well, they will gradually, uh, will, they will slowly catch up with the with the other nodes because well, all the states are actually anyways were installed in uh, we, is persisted in S3, and we will never need to worry about okay how we do state migration or some other fancy technologies, right? Okay, so then let's talk about the schema uh, schema evolution, right? For schema evolution, many people may wonder, OK, why is it related to state management, right? So to answer this question, let's first understand what state schema evolution means. Well, it actually can mean a lot of things. But in the stream processing concept, many, whenever we talk about this, uh, schema evolution, we are actually talking about one, uh, one of those things. That is, well, I mean, the query may change, right? Quer queries may, may be modified from time to time. Why this can happen, right? Let's imagine that okay, we are processing some, I mean, some data from some crypto exchange, right? And let's say that okay, if, the, uh, if the upstream data schema gets changed, then essentially our, uh, the, uh, our query may be impacted. So we actually have to modify the query. Or some people just want to change the business logic, right? 
probably in the past we want to monitor, okay, the, okay the, this is to calculate the tumble window, right? Well, tumble, tumble window of, like, let's say, five seconds. But now probably the business people say, that, okay, look, well, we do not just care about well, the, the data of the last five seconds. We care about the data of the last one minute. Right. So essentially, you actually need to change the business logic, and which that means that you actually need to change the query. So that's schema evolution, right? Well, that's, so that's schema change, right? So that's schema change. And for schema change, the key, one of the key things here is that you actually have to do a thing called backfilling. Why? Because well, for different states, uh, for, let's say that okay, we want to change the interval the uh, of the hopping window from, let's say, 5 seconds to 60 seconds. Because for the state, because for every single query, we need to maintain a state, we actually have to think about okay, how we can repopulate the state, right? Because we cannot just reuse the states of the previous uh, a query, right? So in this case, we actually have to introduce a concept called backfilling. And backfilling is all about well, how we can recover the state from the, uh, recompute the state, right? Then let's go back to the question. Why S3 is the, uh, prim uh, the, the primary, sto uh, primary storage architecture can help accelerate the schema change, right? Can help with the schema change. The reason here is that okay, we can essentially scale out the, uh, the, the system during the recomputation or during the backfilling stage, right? Let's say that okay, for we have a system, right? We have a stream processing system running in two nodes, and now we want to change the schema. To accelerate the schema change, we can essentially instantly just add more nodes to do the backfilling stage, right? To do the backfilling. And then after backfilling, we can easily scale down, right? We scale, uh, scale, scale in into two different uh, two nodes, right? In this query, uh, in, this, uh, in this example, we essentially scale up from two different nodes, uh, two nodes to six nodes. So that with the backfilling, uh, it's actually uh, accelerated by three times, right? Imagine that we're in the past, we'll probably need to run the system for the back backfilling stage for, let's say, 60 minutes, right? Now you just need to spend 20 minutes in, sc in scaling, in, in backfilling, right? So we talked a lot about, well, okay, S3, the goodness of the S3 as a primary storage architecture, right? But then let's talk about well, the dark side, right? Well, or the, or the bias, bad side, right? The bad side will definitely is about the latency, right? Well, it's actually not just about the latency, it's also about the, about the cost, right? If you have experience dealing with S3, you will know that okay, S3's latency can be as high as, high as 100 milliseconds or even 200 milliseconds, right? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty high. And uh, S3 actually AWS charges you based on, let's say, the, uh, it's not based on the amount of storage, right? It actually charges you based on the amount of access, right? Every time you put a data or get a data from S3, you will be charged. That's how, S3, uh, how AWS makes money, right? So definitely we do not really want to, <laughs> yeah, with so much money uh, in AWS, and we don't really want to really spend uh, 100 milliseconds in, uh, in assessing data from S3, then what do we can do? Well, that's why we need to have, a, have this architecture, right, for the, basically the tier storage. So essentially, as, as the name indicates, right, well, basically the idea is that we actually need to have the hot data, need to maintain the hot data or the cache, right, well, or, the, or, the, or the probably reason data or probably cache, right, both the cache and both the reason, uh, and, and the reason data in EC2 instances, right, because we're EC2 has its own memory as well as the local storage, right, of NVMe storage, right. And uh, potentially we can also maintain the warm data in EC2, but totally depends on the, but totally depends on your, I mean, the data size. But for the cool data, I mean, we can always store in S3. Well, using tier storage, what we find is that we, it, uh, mo in most cases, we can help people to reduce the latency. But don't forget that, well, again, I mean, instead of, uh, not just, uh, whenever you use S3, we do not need to, we, we should not just worry about the latency. We should also, also, we, uh, we should also worry about the cost, right? And in using tier storage, well, we still need to access the, uh, access the latency. Uh, sorry, we still need to access the S3, right? Because we actually need to have a concept called compaction, right? If we do compaction aggressively, then the problem here is that we actually essentially access the S3 uh, uh, in, many, in many times, right? Well, so that we, potentially we can 
I mean, be charged, right? Or be charged by a lot of money, right? We, we, we potentially we can spend a lot of money in S3, right? So in Rising Wave, what we did is that we actually introduced a concept called well, the remote compaction. So instead of letting, the, letting every single machine to decide when to compact, we actually compact periodically, essentially, and using remote machine. So why we do that? Well, essentially, it makes the a compaction coordinated, right? Let's say that you have 10 different machines. If we just use something like, OK, um, uh, for every single machine, we just let, uh, let every single machine to do the compaction. Then the problem here is that okay, for they are not coordinated, and they may just aggressively dump the data into S3. But if we have the, if we have the concept called the remote compaction, then all the compactions will be coordinated by probably just one or two machines. And for, for compaction, if you have experiments dealing with StruxDB, you will know that well, compaction also can eat, a lot, uh, eat up a lot of CPU cycles, right? Using remote compaction mechanism, it also brings another advantage that well, you can actually scale in and out the compaction. Right? So you never need to worry about, well, OK, the, uh, the, the CPU cycles, well, how much CPU cycles uh, could be wasted. Right? Yeah, so yeah, uh, OK, so we talk a lot about for the S3, S3 as a stor a primary storage ar architecture, right? So to summarize, what this architecture, what kind of benefits this architecture can bring to us? Well, essentially, it brings four benefits. The first one is that okay, we can use this architecture to efficiently support complex queries. And the second one is that we can easily achieve high availability. Right? And the third one is that okay, it can definitely achieve instant scaling. And the fourth one is that okay, it helps us to accelerate schema change. Right? Yeah, that's all my talk. And thanks for listening. And if you're interested in this, well, I mean, Rising Wave and uh, this technology, and as well as well, how this can perform in real world in, in production, then feel free to join the SAC community. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, when you have these remote compactors and you have this tiered storage, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't you run into some of the same problems with, like, what if some of your machines that have some of the hot or warm data or are in the compaction machines, what if those, those machines go down, right? So then you're losing this advantage of having everything in S3 always yeah. that you talked about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think that, well, definitely we have a, we have mechanism code. Well, we actually persist the met we have actually have the better data. <laughs> So you actually need to uh, persist all this information. Well, in stream processing, I think a tricky part for in stream processing, you actually, you actually need to log a lot of uh, metadata. For example, the progress, right? So for example, the epoch, right? And, uh, and uh, yeah. And in this case, in remote compaction, you also need to uh, log, well, essentially, to, to record well, the, how much data you have already compacted, right? So that, well, if something yeah, let's say no failure occurred, you, you, you should understand, okay, how we can recover the states, right? Or how we can recover the, basically the, the tier storage. Yeah. So essentially in our case, so we actually have persist all, the, all this information, the, basically the progress in, the, in metadata. And the metadata we actually, we used to use ETCD, but for the, um, yeah, as long as you have experience managing ETCD, you will know that for ETCD is more, I mean, it's really difficult to configure. So we migrated well, to, I mean, to, we basically implemented a new mechanism called, well, I mean, pluggable meta, uh, metadata. Basically, you can use Postgres or using any cloud systems you want to use, or even your, uh, yeah, any system you want to use um, to serve as the metadata. So that's where you can achieve higher availability. Uh, what's your latency for recovery with this system? Co co uh, recovery? Like when you have a critical failure of a machine, like you talked about, what is your latency now for that recovery after implementing this and then made yeah. the, that? Uh, uh, 
uh, typically it's in seconds. So our recovery is pretty pretty good. Well, it's just in seconds. Well, in most cases. So um, yeah. So basically, recovery um, in our case means that well, um, let's go back to the previous slide. Well, so basically, the uh, for the, we actually have a concept called epoch, and uh, uh, and uh, for epoch, well, the epoch oh, uh, one epoch size is uh, is actually around uh, 100 milliseconds. So basically, to recover, you only need to recover this uh, the data within this 100, 100 millisecond. So it's just, I mean, typically it's seconds, yeah. Unless well, you have a super high yeah, volume amount, of, uh, yeah, high, high volumes, but uh, typically it's seconds, yeah. Thank you so much, great talk. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, um, hi. <clears throat> um, so can you talk about, um, in stream processing, um, can you unify the architecture so that you can do sort of lazy processing of some information that the users, you mm -hmm. know, we may have some sort of long tail problem where the users m may only be interested in, let's say, 1% of the data coming in at any given time. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So we are thinking about that. Well, the, the reason we think about it that way is not because, well, um, I mean, let's say, I mean, uh, I want to refresh my thread to every six seconds or every 10 seconds or probably um, 20 seconds. It's more about well, the limitation of the stream processing. I think well, for stream processing, one of the limitations is that well, it could not, uh, not all the queries could be uh, computed incrementally. So in some cases, well, especially in our case, well, all, um, yeah, actually many of our customers are actually from the financial services. And uh, these guys really want to do the live market computation. And in live market computation, you actually need to do some math, right? We'll think about, yeah, I'm not a, yeah, expert in that domain, but well, you can just imagine that's where they, they actually do some math well, within a time window, right? So sometimes well, they actually want to do calculate, calculate uh, some, some stats within this window, specific window, right? And you cannot just do, I mean, uh, incremental computation. But uh, uh, because of this, well, it, it actually motivates us think to, to think about a well, lazy evaluation. So instead of like having, um, uh, instead of doing computation every time a new t a new table comes in, can we just I mean buffer this data right? Well, let's say buffer this data for thirty seconds or probably one minute right? Or, or probably a configurable configurable time um, time time amount right? And then once the uh, once we if we, once we have enough data, then we can do the I mean the lazy evaluation. Um, so we 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 still think about that, but potentially we can think about that, yeah, in the future, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you were talking, um, but for the beginning, that you're also considering hash tables and joins, like s as part of the state that you were offloading um, to uh, uh, to persistent storage more, um, and. I was wondering, so if you are actually offloading hash tables for joins, that means that, and you're not keeping everything, the whole hash table for one node in, as the hot data, right? Because that's the whole point, right? That you're not keeping everything there. Then you might incur some very costly misses, right? Like when you're probing against the hash table because you might have, have to go to cold storage. So how, how are you handling this? Or do you just keep everything or do you, um, do you just like cycle out like some parts of the hash table that are not not used at the moment? You keep track of that with some statistics, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, we, we actually have some stats. Yeah, so basically you cannot well, just store everything in S3. Uh, it's not doable, and uh, it doesn't really work. So basically you actually need to for hash table. Um, yeah, for hash table case, well, um, I don't really have an exact answer at the moment, but for definitely you can check out documentation. So basically, we actually maintain some stats so that you do not need to go to the S3. For example, for the hash table, right, where you can essentially have something like, uh, I haven't coded for, for years, but <laughs> but essentially you can, you can you can maintain some stats so that you can check the stats, okay, and, and basically it gives you the hint about okay, whether there's some hit or uh, hit, right, or catch miss, right? Um, Probably we have the bloom filter, but I, yeah, but I do not really have a definite answer at the moment. Yeah, but we do maintain some tests. Yes. Thank you.
Thank you, Ying Yun, for your detailed presentation and for answering all the questions. Feel free to engage more with Ying Yun during the break. Mm -hmm.